Bonjour Dans cette période inédite, Mythique accompagne les célibataires, les couples et tous les amoureux pour aborder ce déconfinement en toute sérénité. Comment entretenir la flamme Comment appréhender la rencontre Comment draguer Pour avoir les réponses, écoutez le tout nouveau podcast de Mythique, Amour et déconfinement, disponible sur toutes les plateformes de podcast. Bye Mythique Hello everyone and welcome to the Phileas Club. My name is Patrick Beja and usually on this show we cover the news from around the world with people from different backgrounds, different uh, countries, different cultures and they give us their views on, on the things that have been happening and occasionally we do a special like this one where we kind of make a deep dive into one specific topic and usually we speak with one specific person. Uh, I, my name is Patrick Beja, I can't remember if I mentioned this, um, but I'm welcoming to the show today Gunnar Carlson, who's been on the show once before, uh, so returning uh, guest Gunnar Carlson, who, as you've probably uh, gathered from the title of the episode, is from uh, Minnesota. Welcome to the show, Gunnar. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Patrick. Nice to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, before we even start, <laughs> I feel like, you know, I, I want to acknowledge the fact that I usually try to keep the show pretty upbeat and even yeah. with somber topics we we try to uh, keep things as light-hearted as possible you know in the context of the pandemic we've been relatively i don't want to say optimistic but it's not even about a slant it's about how we approach a topic but every once in a while mm -hmm. there's going to be one which is so heavy that it's a lot more difficult to do and, and you know maybe it's not even appropriate to to do that uh, and this is definitely one of those shows so maybe a little bit less laughs and uh yeah. but definitely a little bit uh more of an important topic i do also want to say before um i start shutting up which is going to happen <laughs> very soon but um i do want to mention you know We're going to be talking about Minneapolis, life in Minneapolis, what it was before, what it has been in the past few days, um, the relationships between the different communities. And surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly, this is a very divisive topic, especially in the US, uh, maybe uh, specifically in the US. And I would like to invite everyone listening to do exactly that, to listen and to not immediately go to their views on this topic as a matter of principle. Just, you don't have to agree with everything. You don't have to, I don't even know what we're going to be saying really, but this is a, a core principle of the show. Uh, you don't have to agree with everything, but what I ask of you is that you Keep your ears open. Just, you know, maybe you're going to glean something if you pay attention that you might not have thought of. And I suspect in this case, this is going to apply more to our conservative listeners. Over the past few episodes, for those who haven't listened to the show before, I, I, I would have said this in reverse for... Um, liberal listeners, because as we've been talking about the pandemic, um, we've been hearing from people that they might not have been used to listening to. And I, I was asking more liberal listeners to, to keep their ears open and their minds open. So this is not about partisanship. It's really just about asking for a little bit of effort on your part and, and just listening and judge maybe at the very end of the episode when you've listen really listen to everything and even better don't judge just just listen and then you finish it up and you're like okay that was that was interesting or not but 
I give, I give it a, a, an honest listen. And of course, um, there is a lot of people who aren't in the US who might be even more interested in finding out about all of this because we have less context probably than, uh, than those who are in the US. So, all right, that was my disclaimer. I've already spoken for a little bit too long. Uh, Gunnar, mm -hmm. before we dive into the topic at hand, can you tell us a little bit about yourself so that the listeners have a bit of context for who you are? Yeah, um, thanks. I am uh, I'm a lifetime resident of Minnesota. Um, I spent most of my life living in, well, when I was very small, when my mother um, had me, you know, we lived in South Minneapolis, so not far from the area uh, where this incident um, took place that ignited all of this unrest. Uh, then we moved to the western side, was about 20 minutes away from there, which is where I grew up and spent most of my life. And then recently, in the last five years, we moved back into Minneapolis, and specifically, my wife and I moved in North Minneapolis. So we live in um, a historically black neighborhood and a neighborhood that is. Uh, underserved, I guess, is the nice way to put it. Um, and over policed. So that's a little bit about me. I mean, I, uh, I'm 43 years old. Um, as I said, I've always lived and worked in, in Minnesota and in Minneapolis, really, in the surrounding area. I recently went back to school uh, and was attending the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, just graduated. Um, thank goodness. Got my master's um, in public affairs. And so I have been spending the last couple of years, really, uh, in the course of pursuing that academic um, degree doing a lot of research around um, race and really with outdoor recreation and minority youth. That's really my my specialty um, and where I spend a lot of my time. Um, yeah, so that's a bit about me, I guess. You didn't mention uh, that you're mixed race. Uh, yes, I don't know how I'm sorry. important <laughs> that is. <laughs> I, am, um, I, am, I am mixed race, so I am a, a black man in America would be the way I put it right now. You know, that's that's actually something, I guess it's the same everywhere, but uh, if you're mixed race, you're considered black. Why not white? I, 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 I asked a question I don't really mean to ask, to, you know, I don't expect an answer, but it's just... I, honestly, I mean, it's, it's I, I can give you an answer. I um, okay. Recently for my schoolwork, actually, I traveled to Ghana. I was, I, I went to Africa to do some research um, right before this pandemic hit. That was real fun. I came home on March 20th, actually. But um, mm. <laughs> so uh, I got that chance to really examine my race and my positionality in the world and all that, you know, from a new perspective. And uh you know, in America, if your if your skin is dark, you are you are what um, the the dominant culture, what the white culture considers you and calls you, and that's what I've always been. Um, biracial is the term that I have always referred to myself as. Um, I was raised by my white mother um, as, as a single mom, so I grew up in white culture um, and spent most of my time there. So, I mean, this is what I know. Yet, um, due to the color of my skin. Uh, I, I'm treated differently. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. the reality. Um, one one of the ways that I point that out and and make sure people understand what I'm saying, and and I had to express in in class with you know mid career professionals, so we're all adults. But I had to say, you know, I was 34 years old before I stopped being pulled out of the car, handcuffed, and sat on the side of the road or on the curb when I would get pulled over. And I'm used to getting pulled over. It wasn't until I was in my mid to late 30s that I did not get pulled over multiple times per year. Granted, I've had two speeding tickets in my life um, and no other moving violations or anything. I've never had, you know, a criminal record or anything. There's no reason for me to be getting pulled over all the time. That's just how it goes. Um, all right. Maybe we can uh, take a, a little bit of a step back and explain to the people who might not know uh, what has been happening in Minneapolis in the past few days or week. Um, because that's been a yeah, it's uh, I, I'm sure everyone in the U.S. and most people outside the the U.S. know what's been happening, but if you can describe it in your own words, yeah. So on uh, May 25th. Um, an African-American man whose name was George Floyd was uh, murdered by the police um, for 
eight minutes and 46 seconds, um, an officer, an officer by the name of Derek Chauvin, kneeled on his neck while he said, I can't breathe. And he begged for him to get off of his neck. Um, he did not get off his neck until um, Mr. Floyd had blood coming out of his nose and mouth. Um, and he had uh, evacuated his his body. Um, you know, he had, he had wet himself and everything on the side of the road before he removed himself from his neck and allowed anyone to even try and offer medical attention to George Floyd. Um, it was recorded on cell phone video by a young lady. And um, the initial reports that came out from Minneapolis police were that, um, you know, unfortunately, a suspect died in custody after suffering a medical incident. And all, you know, medical attention was given to him and he was tried to be resuscitated at, you know, the local medical center and uh, they were unable to revive him. And, you know, the usual thing we hear here in America, which was, you know, we're sorry to have lost this. We're looking into it. You know, we'll get to the bottom of this. The officers have been placed on on leave while we investigate, um, which is normally what happens. But we heard nothing else. Then cell phone footage came out and we saw what in actuality had happened, which is one officer standing on this man's neck while he was handcuffed. He had already been handcuffed and was in custody. There was no need for this. There were four officers there, um, one kneeling on him, but the other three were trying to keep the entire crowd away and telling people to move on. And there was nothing to see there. Um, you, you can see all this play out on video. I do not recommend that anyone watch it. Um, if you have kids around or if you don't want to see a man's life extinguished, because that is what you will see. Um, yeah. And so after that cell phone video came out and the footage was seen, the Minneapolis police department had to walk back their statement and, um, let everybody know that they were looking into this incident some more that immediately led to, the first demonstrations, this all happened at an intersection known as 38th and Chicago Avenue. Um, it's over in the south part of Minneapolis. It's a very uh, culturally diverse part of town. A lot of Native Americans, a lot of uh, Hispanic, um, a lot of immigrants um, in this area. Um, and initially, you, you had some small protest. And as no officers were arrested, um, these protests grew. And we are now, uh, just to fast forward a bit, I guess, I'm just going just gonna to get you to where we are now, which is um, the last few nights we have been under a curfew that is imposed by 1,500 National Guards troops along with um, the Minneapolis I mean Police Department. The, yeah. There was there was uh, a few nights of demonstration and rioting. Um, yes, that which is, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah. So we, I, I don't want to skip that with, part because I think it's no, it's important for people who are it, it, outside it is, of this to understand. It is yes. So um, protest grew, and really, what the protesters were calling for is for all four officers involved that we can see on this video to be arrested. Um, the, the officer who stood on his neck was arrested after two nights of protesting, but the protests have still grown. The first night, the protests were, um, that, that initial night of George's death, the protests were fairly small and fairly, um, fairly nonviolent after that. And as protests grew and as people grew tired of, um, waiting for, Ju justice to be served. We, um, we had the, the police come in and really when the police came in and tried to break up the riot or, or excuse me, the demonstration, the first night they came in as they do here in, in the U S um, in full riot gear, firing tear gas and things into a peaceful protest crowd. I want to say that in my opinion, I fully believe that that is the spark that led to the escalation of violence and, um, 
uh, you know, the rioting, really. We have two factions, really, that are going on. We have very peaceful protests during the day right now uh, in very large numbers. I have gone to a few of these now where you've got, you know, a few thousand people. Um, of course, all this is happening during the time of COVID, so everyone's in masks and we're trying to keep some distance. But um, it's a protest. It's a rally. You know, mm-hmm. people are closer than they probably should be. Um but then the night comes and then we have the fires and we have looting and we have um, really what I guess I would refer to as mayhem that started. And so the first night that we had the escalation and I knew it was going to get bad was when, you know, the, the, the mob, the group is moving down one of the main streets here, Lake Street, um, and they're just burning. They're destroying buildings and they are burning um, vehicles. Uh, anything they can in their way. And then eventually this led to the fifth precinct, which is the police precinct where this officer was from, um, was abandoned by the police and, and allowed to be burned by the protesters. Um, so they burned down a police station or burned out, I guess I should say. Um, which is when we knew, I mean, that was kind of, that was when we knew the governor was stepping in. Um, that's when we knew the, the National Guard was being called up to help with this. Um, there was an initial deployment of around 700 National Guardsmen to help our police and our state patrol. Um, they so then what was called your, up another... What was, yeah? Just to, to pause for a second, during yeah. those first few nights, and I, I want to go back to... Uh, a little bit of a broader context about yeah, yeah. the situation in, in Minneapolis at some point. But what was your sentiment? And maybe if you can give us the sentiment of the community, of your community, during those first few nights um, before things got completely out of hand at, yeah. you know, the, the, the first protests and then the first rioting. Mm-hmm. Um, for me personally, my sentiment was, um, immediately that all four of these officers should be arrested. Um, they were fired pretty quickly. That is something important I need to say. Our mayor, Jacob Frey and, uh, and our chief of police, um, Aaron Dondo, I believe is, is how you pronounce his last name. Our, Our chief of police is a black man. Um, fairly new. He's, he was hired on in the last couple of years here. Um, and Jacob Frey is a very young mayor. He's 38 years old. And he came out pretty quickly and said that this was wrong, that these officers should be arrested. He, he was very quick to say that and that they had been fired. All four of them had been fired. This does not normally happen. Um, Normally what happens to police involved in shootings and involved in these things in violence here in the U.S., they get put on administrative leave with pay. Um, That was not the case here. They tried to give us the message that, you know, they have been fired and we are looking into this. That wasn't enough. You know, they needed to be arrested. And that was really the... That didn't appease your your frustration and your anger and your community's anger that was felt as a token gesture or right sincere, but because not we've enough, seen or? this before mm. um you know in this community specifically uh, philando castile um jamal clark like we have instances in minneapolis in north minneapolis in the last few years just the last few years of um black men being killed by the police and then the police being placed on administrative leave, but ultimately all that leads to is an investigation that says we've deemed this a justifiable shooting. That is the phrase that is used. I don't know who justified that it was okay, um, you know, or a justifiable killing, I guess, would be in this instance. Um, so people felt like that is what it was just going to happen again. Do you um, feel like it wasn't this, good this instance is even worse than those others or because it seems like it's even you know whatever that means it's even less justifiable and i say this i understand what justifiable means but right it really seems that out of all of these um stories that we hear from the outside uh there's always kind of an angle of 
well, maybe that was a violent criminal. Maybe they thought they had a gun. Things are so violent in the U.S. Police use, you know, that kind of force all the time. This was an unfortunate incident. Any kind of excuse you want to make for these things, which can or cannot be justifiable. In this case, it seems like that doesn't hold even the the uh, most partisan of scrutinies um, here. Did that play a role or is that just... I, I definitely more. think that plays a role in um, the energy of the protests and where we're at now. I mean, there is no, none of those excuses are available. There was no weapon. There was no fighting. Every mm -hmm. bit of video evidence that we've seen um, from security cameras around the area, because this is a busy corner and there's lots of mm -hmm. businesses right there. So they've been giving their footage, the cell phone footage we've seen, the body camera footage they've released so far from these, these police officers. Um, George Floyd was not resisting. He was not fighting with police. He, you know, he didn't have a weapon. Nothing was there. What you see through almost nine minutes, again, it's eight minutes and 46 seconds, is this man on the ground pleading for his life and saying he can't breathe. This officer never moves, um, never, never moves that that knee from his neck. Uh, and and. Yeah, I mean, that that is one thing as you look for, you know, I, a positive sign and it's hard right now. But one positive thing we're seeing is that everyone there are people that I would have never imagined um, who wouldn't be saying blue lives matter um, and these police have a tough job. And, you know, you just have to listen to the police. And this is what happens when you don't listen. We're not who, hearing that right saying now. Who, who would be saying this? You, you, right. you said you yeah. wouldn't be saying this, but yep, right. yep. They're, they're not saying that right mm -hmm. now. They're saying that this officer and these these officers need to be dealt with, that this was um, excessive. And I'm hearing that from everyone. Now, when you get to the protests, then you start to get some of the partisan opinions on things right now. Um, and and that that's where that comes. But in terms of these officers and the actions they took in bringing an end to this man's life, we are not seeing um, partisan divide. So where does the... I guess if everyone agrees and everyone understands that everyone agrees, um, I'm asking kind of guessing the answer, but the protests come from the, like, people don't see this in the black community. People don't see this as, well, sometimes things, uh, you know, some bad people do bad things and it happens and they will be dealt with. It's the, the last in a long string of things. And, and I guess what I'm trying to ask is, if everyone agrees that this was bad and those police officers needs, need to be uh, uh, dealt with, for lack of a better word, why are the riots happening? Why is the, are the protests so... I can understand the protests, protests, but where is the conflict coming from, if everyone agrees, I guess? So the conflict arises from that all four officers haven't been arrested. Really, this is a protest that is calling for systemic change in our government and in our police system um, and in the way that our police are allowed to act in our community and to treat our citizens and all our citizens. Um, and so I think part of the reason you're seeing the protests grow and intensify is that as the police try to tamp down the the protests, they are they are doing so in a very militaristic way. Mm. Um, they are using. I actually I, I'm an amateur photographer, so I'm out documenting this stuff and taking pictures yesterday. And all of a sudden, I come across and it's a 40 millimeter shell that they fire when they fire these rubber bullets. It's a giant projectile they're using to shoot at people. I mean, it's, it's big. It, that thing's coming out of a small cannon, you know? Um, it, it, it's, I, so, I don't know if you're not, yeah. When, when, when you're saying systemic change, um, that's something I, I want to explore a little bit further. Yeah. And of course, the violence of the way the police is, and, and we see this, I'm sure, it, I mean, I know it's debated in the US, but we look at it, 
from outside of the U.S. even. And we have our share of issues with police, excessive force and, and brutality and violence. Even in France, maybe especially in France, I don't know, but during the protests and riots of the yellow jackets that we have mm -hmm. talked about on this show on, on several, uh, you know, over the past year, several times, there were multiple instances of unacceptable police uh, brutality and excessive force, which I don't think I haven't been following to the, you know, specifically um, very precisely, but I don't think at least all of them have been dealt with appropriately, probably not probably only the minority, if that. But when we have issues here, the issues we see is are someone who is in handcuffs intentionally tripped. That is an image that stuck with me. Intentionally tripped to fall flat on their face and really hurting themselves. Or yeah. someone who's fired on with a rubber bullet way too close or with a, a you know smoke grenade or maybe even mm -hmm. hit with a baton or something, not a baton, like a, a yeah, the thing that yeah. police use. But <laughs> the attitude, uh, the police doesn't have the same kind of militaristic attitude and, and hardware and things like that. And I guess I want to get back to the sentiment because everyone can see what's happening now. I think as we've mentioned, as we've established, everyone agrees that what happened with this latest incident is horrifying and unjustifiable. But I think what some people will not manage to internalize is how your community receives that event. And, and you mentioned it a couple of times with the fact that it's not an isolated event, but I really want you to explain to us, and to me, this is a selfish conversation we're having now, it's yeah. really just for me, what the, the mindset of you and your community is, maybe even on a daily basis, without even uh, talking about these incidents, but what life is for, for, for you, I guess. Yeah, so the um, just to explain that a bit i'm I'm gonna take a step back and just say you know minneapolis um as a city has a police force of about 800 officers um 90 i think it's about 94 percent right now less than 50 officers live actually live in the city of minneapolis they they, they are policing an area that they do not live in they do not know they are not from here um our police force as it sits right now and i don't well, why have is the that sorry i i it's it oh, seems yeah? strange that of course you're going to have some people who aren't from there but that's a, a lot of the you know big proportion why do you think that is what what's the reason behind um, this because they're not required to live in the city and living in the city is you know they all want to be in the suburbs i mean mm -hmm. you if if your police force is mostly white and white middle to upper middle class um, wage earners, they they don't want to live here. And partially I can say I have some friends who are officers and I've spoken to some of them and um, one of them, um, she, she works in a special unit. So she actually, her partner is a social worker and they try to do things a little differently. They have a different style of policing than the majority of the police force in this town. And she does live um, within city limits and she has spoken to me in the past about what that means to her life outside of her job and the stress and fear that puts on her at times of running into someone that she's had to deal with um, professionally, we'll say, you know, as a, as a police officer enforcing the law. And just what that means in terms of where you live, how you go out, where she can go to eat, where she doesn't feel, you know, she's welcome to even go grab a meal or whatever. So I, I get that partially. You want to be able to keep your, you know, your family and everyone safe and you don't want to put them in harm's way when, but it also leads to this dynamic where you really have what feels like an occupying force. You have people mm -hmm. that don't really, you know, they work here, but they don't live here. They're not invested in the community. So just on, on the, you know, that's and, the first piece. The second piece that's is, an, is the, a very interesting term. And I, I want to pause for just a second. Yeah. Occupying force, is that a term that is used regularly to describe 
how it feels like you feel like yes. it's strangers foreigners being the police in your home i guess or yeah that that is what it is i mean when it's a majority white male police force enforcing the law as they see fit to with impunity doing what they want to do making random traffic stops um for no reason um you know roughing you up a bit while they make that traffic stop interrogating how, how, you how does that uh, oh okay two questions first of yeah. all what's the uh ratio of of black to white in within the city of minneapolis you have a, uh, minneapolis is roughly about 65 white i would say right now i don't have the you know the exact latest figures but somewhere between 60 and 65 probably white mm. okay. now the north minneapolis area where i live is probably you know it's reversed it might even be as high as about 80 to 90 percent right now mm. black or people of color Okay. I'm guessing it's 60, 70% um, black and then, you know, might get up in, you know, 80 plus percents when you include all other people of color. Okay. Um, so it definitely for that part of the city, especially it's a bunch mm -hmm. of white cops policing a uh, predominantly black neighborhood. Right. And you say roughing you up. How does that, because we hear that all the time, how does that actually... Um, take place what what actually happens and what's maybe happened to you um which is not leading to you know the death or anything yeah. like that but like the daily life of a person from a black person from minneapolis yeah getting arrested or or just you know pulled over so as i said i have never been arrested um yeah i, I meant clean, yeah the day you know a clean record yeah. no i'm just i just want to say this to make this point i've never been arrested i have been placed in handcuffs um over a dozen times in my life and i have not been pulled over now um and taken out of a vehicle when i've been pulled over for about 10 years like i said it's it was i was in my mid-30s the last time that happened um, do you think it's because so, of your age or because things got I think as I've gotten as I've gotten older um I, I fully admit when I was a kid I was dumb I mean I had license plates on my car that said G thing I had a big stereo in there you know I did all mm. that dumb shit the kids do um and so I you know I I will say some of it's there I mean if I was doing that job and I had to look for suspects or see what was going on mm. I might be pulling me over too but it's one of these things where I learned when I was old enough to drive, my mother taught me when you get pulled over, you turn that car off, you take those keys out of the ignition, you put them on the dashboard and your hands sit on that steering wheel. If they ask you to do something, you announce that you are complying and you tell them what you are going to do before you move. Mm. Um, and this is what I have done my whole life. Getting roughed up would mean usually for me personally, it is, um, You know, if they're going to pull you over and they're going to take you out, they're going to grab you and yank you out a little harder. They're going to place you in the cuffs right away. And I will admit I am a six foot tall, you know, 250 pound black man who goes to the gym all the time. But just the fact that I am big and strong does not, you know, my body is not, should not, your fear of my body should not <laughs> give you the right to do these things to someone. Um, mm -hmm. Yet they happen. So, you know, you get pushed, like you were saying, um, you know, shoved and just, there's just a lot of that kind of intimidating behavior. Um, Which and, goes and beyond, let's, let's be clear about this. It goes beyond what is necessary to make sure that the police doing their job don't come into harm's way, right? This is not just to make sure I that because say. you're big. That would be big, my opinion. Right. It's not that right. you're big and you could punch them and they fall down and can't get back up. It's not just that they're making sure you can't escape if you're a, 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 a potential criminal. It goes right. beyond it. It's like, yeah. yes. Mm. I mean, you know, a, a traditional traffic stop is, as we all know, right? You get pulled over. They come up. Um, I, I actually, well, I think back I, to the, I, you know. I don't know. I'll, I'll say well, that. Yeah. And I think it will. I, I, it's important to say Because yeah. I think a lot of people, I don't know, maybe they've seen movies, so they, they think like they know, right. um, or they feel it's familiar. I don't know. I've, and so I, I don't live in the US. I don't, I've right. never been pulled over. I've never been 
handcuffs on me maybe once or twice in my life when it was like trivial and they were like hey how's it going so you did this and i was like ah sorry officer high five and that was it right <laughs> um i'm barely exaggerating but yeah. um yeah so i don't know it, i think that's well a, that's okay so situation. i guess just to paint the picture then like a normal traffic stop or what i would consider normal or i can think back to one of the best traffic stops i ever had i was driving through iowa on my way home and I fully admit I was speeding. And so I'm speeding and and then, you know, the lights go on behind you and I'm pulling over and I pull over and I had a couple other people in the car with me, but it was an Iowa state trooper and he came up and he just said, ah, good afternoon, sir. How you doing? Why are you in such a hurry? Mm. Said, ah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get home and I'm in a, a group with my friends here in the other cars and they were speeding and I was just trying to catch up. Um, so I didn't get lost. And he's like, ah, you never want to be the last one. Cause you're always the one I get, you know, and he's kind of joking. He's light about it. He's like, well, I don't want you to get too far behind him. I'll get you on your way as soon as soon as I can, but can I get your license and your registration and you just stay put? Okay. I said, all right. I gave him the paperwork. He went back he came back. He said, unfortunately, I'm going to give you a ticket, but you can just mail this in, get on your way. Don't drive too fast, but I understand you got to catch up to your friends. Be safe out there. Have a good day. I said, thank you. He turned around and went back to his vehicle and I was on my way again. It was probably a 10 minute interaction. He ticketed me. He did what he had to do, but he didn't, you know, belittle me. Um, he did not call me any names. He didn't take me out of the car and, and, you know, detain me. He didn't do any of that. It was just, you, you broke the law. It's a minor offense. I'm going to treat it as such. Here's your ticket. Have a good day. That's a good interaction. Now in North Minneapolis and in Minneapolis, what I see specifically and what I have experienced and what I witness every day, if there's going to be a traffic stop, <clears throat> it is generally not going to be done by a single officer. Um, the single officer is going to start the, the uh, you know, the pullover and then they may wait and keep you there until at least one other unit shows up, sometimes multiple units. This is before they've even approached the car, before they even know what's going on. They haven't assessed the situation. They've already made a determination that they need extra help there. And so by the time you get... They get to you, you have two or three cars on you, all with their floodlights on. So you have that whole situation where you can't see and the lights are bright. And then somebody's going to come up to the car. They usually stay behind your open window and the, or they're on their loudspeaker and they're barking commands at you that, you know, if you're me and your hearing is bad because of that loud stereo I mentioned before that my mother hit it, uh, you know, you can't really even hear and make out what they're saying. And so you've got this whole situation going on um, or they come up and they stand behind the open window to protect themselves in case you have a weapon and they're yelling and barking, you know, commands at you. They're not really talking to you and, and interrogating you. Where are you going? What are you doing? Um, and, you know, you ask, why did you pull me over? And, you know, I have personally been told, you know, don't worry about that. Answer my questions. I'm the one asking the questions here. Mm. So that's that's kind of the difference between what I would consider a routine or a normal or what I would expect and what I wouldn't have a problem with traffic stop as opposed to a traffic stop in Minneapolis and a lot of times in North Minneapolis. Almost always it's going to end up um, with with a search of the vehicle, whether it just be them telling everyone not to move and getting a couple of officers with their lights, looking everything over, asking you what this is, what that is. And it's like, I just haven't cleaned my car in a while. That's a blanket or, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Or them taking you out of the vehicle and, and searching it. You have this weird thing here where, you know, we have the right to say, no, you can't search my vehicle. But if you do that, then immediately they're like, oh, there's something going on. And then they will detain you and they will say, we have just cause to search this vehicle because you're acting suspicious. So, you know, that that's how that goes. And, and but, okay, I have two questions then. Yeah. Um, why do they do that? Why is it like, is the, the city especially violent? Are they actually at risk of being uh, hurt? Is there a lot of uh, criminal, you know, gangs and, and, and whatnot? People who, when they get arrested for stop sign, they come out shooting? Is that you know, something that has and actually that, happened in the past? I mean, it's it's happened, um, and I'm not going to lie. Minneapolis 
um, is a big city. You know, I mean, it can be like any other big city in North Minneapolis, especially we have a lot of gang activity over here. Um, it can be dangerous. I mean, as I was, uh, telling you, you know, I've been hearing gunfire and we have Black Hawk helicopters overhead right now, but, uh, you know, I joked with a friend the other day, so it's really nothing new. It's not that, you know, crazy to hear, um, like I'll, I'll occasionally hear gunshot. One of the things we say and we joke about is like, was that a firework or was that gunshots? And then you'll listen and you'll be like, Oh no, nope, that was gun gunfire. And it's not within, you know, it's usually a mile or two away from me, but we hear it. Mm. Um, and it does happen a lot here. Gang violence is a problem, um, in North Minneapolis and most of it is further North than me, but it is a problem. Um, the reality for the police, uh, you know, we haven't we haven't had an officer die in the line of duty here. I think in in seven eight years, and I think the last one was a vehicle accident. There are not a lot of officers that are dying, um, you know, due to <clears throat> gun violence from citizenry. Well, I'm going to be, but it could happen. I, I'm going to be an a hole here and say maybe that's why they don't die. Maybe they're so, let's say, careful. Um, that's why they they don't die in in doing their jobs. Um, is that I would agree that that okay. could partially be true. But again, I think we as a citizenry and part of the issue here is that for for most of the white residents of Minnesota, they are they are amazed when I tell them and share my experience of um, interactions with police, and it is not the interactions that they've ever had. And I have ha heard hilarious things to me where people are like, well, you just need to tell them that that is unacceptable and you're not going to do that. <laughs> and I just laugh because I'm like, you do realize that's when we end up dead. That's when we end up shot. Um, Noncompliance is when you get, um, you know, quite frankly, what we say, you're going to get your ass beat. So you don't it's not worth it. I can deal with five to ten minutes of being degraded as a man and emasculated to to keep my life. Um You know, it's an inconvenience, but it is an inconvenience that I have known my whole life and I have grown up with and I am used to. So in, in my personal opinion, the over militarized and the the way that the police go about their business is not okay. It may be a um an extreme version of harm reduction for them, but I don't think that it is in balance with the actual threat of harm. Mm. Um, and I, I, I will fully say I want police officers to be safe. I want interactions to be like that when I described to you with that Iowa state trooper. Um, and that's not to say that Iowa police are better than Minnesota or Minneapolis police. I don't think they are. That's just, that's the example that sticks out in my mind. But if every, mm. you know, if every interaction was like that, there wouldn't be a problem if it was just, you know, Hey, I'm sorry, but you, I caught you breaking the law and I have to do my job and I'll let you go on about your day and have a good day. Then I think. <laughs> we'd be okay. I, I don't want to stick on that point too much, right. but was it like that before? And then, you know, two, three, five police officers died because there was a shifty gang member in that car. No, no, okay. <laughs> no, it has been this way. Um, and it has been this way for years. This is part of the reason we have protests right now and things have risen up. You know, the police have been, in the mind of the black community and in my opinion have been used as an arm of the state to subjugate its black citizens. And when I say the state, I mean the country, the United States of America of the government to, um, to keep black communities down. And, uh, you know, they're, they're one of the tools that's used for that. That's a pretty radical statement. I know that'll probably get some people going. They can email me. We can have a debate. But um, I think we have evidence of that across the country. When you look through this country's racial history and you look to, you know, Brown v. Board of Education or any of these other decisions in terms of civil rights, when African Americans were being denied their civil rights, who was the front line the state used to enforce that denial? It was police and national guard units. Um, yeah. Yeah. So first of all, I do want to ask what percentage of the black Minneapolisian population do you think has 
<laughs> Midiaponitan po population mm. has the same experience, life experience that you do. Is it everyone feels that way? Um, or, you know, it's 10%? What would you estimate? I don't think we can ever speak in absolutes. Um, I think you have to look at the racial lines. And I think if you were to talk to any person of color, you are going to hear a very similar shared experience to mine. Okay. I think if you were to talk to most of the white citizens of Minnesota, you are going to hear a very different shared experience. I think there's no, other, I'm also talking other about the black, the black population specifically. Oh, black community? Yeah. I, I'm going to guess that almost everyone. I mean, you can't okay. say, you know, we can't speak in absolutes, of right? Course. But I, I would guess that nine out of 10 people, yeah. if not more, you know, 95%, 98%, I'm guessing. I, mm. I, I don't run into when I am discussing this issue with people of color. I don't have too many who are, are doing the blue lives matter, um, mm. all lives matter giving me any of that argument that doesn't happen right um and then the other topic i want to discuss a little bit and then we'll go back to what's happening now yeah. but um the 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 as you i can't remember how you put it but this radical statement uh that this attitude by the police is essentially a way for the state to uh keep the black population down this is indeed a very radical uh thing to say do you mean that there is intentional an intentional design by the u.s by the federal government to to what to to keep the black population in fear or impoverished or you know that that's i'm, I'm so we're yeah, I, I need to be clear. We're talking about systems here and and um, systemically. Yes, I do believe that mm. that is that is the way it has always been from the founding of this country. You go back to the Civil War and think about this for a second. The Civil War is the only major war this world has ever seen where the losers were allowed to keep their 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 plunder. You know, they were allowed to keep their land and everything they had. And it, they're even allowed to keep their flag and display it to this day. Who, what other losing nation or force has ever been allowed to tell their history? The winners always write the history. That is not the case unless we have to reconsider who the winners were. And so, well, I, I'm sure you'll you'll find some history buff that will push up their glasses and go, well, actually, uh, and send well, an sir? email. But yeah, I, I get what you mean. The, and again, I would love to debate, but we're talking about, you know, the, the black citizens when they were freed, you know, from slavery and bondage were promised 40 acres and a mule, right? Like that was the first, the first promise that was made is that they were going to get the most important things at that time, which was some of the land that they had always worked to build the wealth for this country um, and, and, a, and a bit of a start. That was taken away almost immediately and there was nothing given. Then you had in place a system where because Sorry, nothing was again, given you. Yeah, Gunner, you know you're. Yeah. keep in mind we. I don't know any of this. Okay, okay, yeah. So when <laughs> so, you go right when you go back to I'm, I'm we're in the Civil War now, and there was after the Civil War when when um the the abolishment of slavery, there was a promise from the federal government that every African American citizen, every every ex slave was going to get forty acres and a mule, which would mm -hmm. have allowed them you know some farmable land. The big you know agriculture was the thing at the time. Um, some farmable land and a place to start their own and to build some personal wealth. And then that promise was reneged on and was never given. And so that mm. starts. And and furthermore, the slave holding landowners down there who started the Civil War were allowed to keep their land holdings and didn't have to give up anything. So you had these the, the people who were motivated enough to start a civil war to continue um you know, earning and, and gaining wealth in the way they always had through slavery, were allowed to keep everything after the Civil War. And, and, and I, I, again, I know history buffs and people will debate on this. And I understand the reasons why it was done, you know, because you had to put a country back together. But that decision was made without any regard for um, black people and for the, the Africans and African-American citizens who were here. This was about restoring the fracture of the white American community. Now you take that from then up through now, and we still have systems in place that keep um, the, the concerns and the cares of the white citizenry 
in the forefront and are always considering them and not concerning themselves about the minority um, in the same way. So, yes, so, I do think that part of it is mm-hmm. that the state is there to, you know, subjugate certain people. And, and so you're saying it's systemic, meaning it's not one big overarching decision of someone rubbing their hands and saying, yes, we're going to keep the black man down. Right. But it is essentially, it, it, tell me if I, you know, maybe misinterpreting this, but it's a series of habits, systems and decisions where people have been favoring the majority and the, the, the white population. And when there's a decision to be made, either because it's the majority or the white population specifically, it's just, we'll leave it like that, or that will make the decision in favor of this. And I, I'm trying to wrap my head up, up, up around how to expose this in the way I'm understanding it. It's not like, I don't think, maybe you would have a different opinion. It doesn't seem like administrations are thinking we are going to be choosing between what benefits the white or the black and we're going to choose what benefits the white but because of the systems and the habits and maybe a little bit of entrenched systemic racism it ends up being a situation where the majority and the whites are favored and the blacks and other minorities are forgotten or get the 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 lesser end of the deal is that a proper way of saying it yes. or do you feel it's, it's yes. more intentional i mean you have a yeah you have a strange thing now where you know we're talking it's it's 400 years of um you know this country and bringing its first slaves here and you know slavery has been abolished for hundreds of years and so you have the people who and they're good meaning people i want to say that i think everybody's good me i mean there are some actual racists out there but i don't i don't think there are many um I, I think that most people are just looking at this in terms of like, well, no, everything needs to be fair and equal for everyone. And we should all have an equal start and an equal opportunity at the American dream. Um, I, I firmly believe that, too. But you also have the problem of we need to address the fact that the systems that you were just describing and, and did so so eloquently that the systemic we're not starting from the same place in this race. And so we need to do some things like we all want to get there. We want to get to that utopia where everybody's just treated the same and we all have the same chance. And it's a truly a same chance from day one to achieve the American dream. We're not there yet. So you need to have some policy and some things in place to help um, accelerate the advancement of those people who have been systemically and and left behind forever historically Um, until we are all starting at the same place. And so there's a major push and pull between those two where, you know, some people say, why should they get all the entitlements and the benefits and the da 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 um, you know, I'm paying taxes and they're getting this and they're getting that. And that's where you run into a lot of the politics of this and mm. you get into um, some identity politics, quite frankly, that just isn't true. I mean, in Minnesota and across this country, one of the largest <clears throat> beneficiaries of entitlement programs is our farmers and our farmers are overwhelmingly white but the amount of money we put into subsidizing the american farmer is far greater than almost all the other what we call entitlement programs you know the food Mm -hmm. um and the the benefits programs and and you know lost wages programs and all that it's it's crazy but we don't look at it that way and that is you know i um, mean couched in race and things it's I think, and let's get back to yeah, the, yeah. the present situation, but it seems to me that when you're thinking about, yes, a, a, an equal start, uh, regardless of the reasoning and the justification, which can, I'm not saying this to be, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, to be ironically, the, the, the actual explaining of how we got to this situation of what you were describing, the life of a black person, a young black man, especially in inside the city of Minneapolis, regardless of why it is like this, I think it's fairly clear to everyone that it is like this. And so mm-hmm. it's very difficult to claim that you do have an equal start When this is what your life is, uh, period. I was going to say growing up, or it's period. This is what your life is. So yeah. 
put aside everything else, partisan consider considerations, uh, entitlements, beneficial treatment, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, affirmative action, put aside all mm -hmm. of this. And if you look at the situation of this community, which it's difficult not to start talking about race because this is the reality of it, it's difficult to claim things are equal because factually, for a number of reasons, they're not. Now, I don't know how you fix it, but it, it's something right. that I think is fairly uh, difficult to, to, to see any other way than this. But um, You'd be amazed, Patrick. I mean, part of the argument you get is like, well, <clears throat> you know, um, you, you get into the they's, you know, well, they just aren't um, taking advantage of their, their uh, education they are unwilling to go out and get a job. They, they, they. And, um, you know, Minnesota is, is one of the best states in this country for quality of life. Um, we rank in the top 10 and the top five in almost every category. But then if you look at it in terms of race, um, we rank in the bottom five in almost every category. You know, wealth, wealth mm. accumulation and that wealth gap, education gap, um, everything. When you look at that in terms of our, our black citizenry, we are... I think it's about 45th and lower, might be 46, but and lower on every category. The average um, African American household has like a $14,000 net worth in Minnesota. It's about a tenth of the average, if not lower, a tenth or a fifteenth of the average, um, you know, white family. The home ownership rate for African Americans, uh, and I am a homeowner, but it's like 24% in mm. in Minnesota. It's well, like obviously, you're not trying hard for... enough, Gunner. Yeah, right, I don't know what right. to tell you. Right? Is that <laughs> like is is this seriously something you? I, I guess it is. It's something you hear, you hear, but yes, that's uh, what it, you hear. T tell me if I'm if I'm wrong. Is this something you hear like on Twitter or on on the from on the media from people who aren't like who don't actually know the situation who don't live there is that something you hear from i guess I mean, I the white there, people but, in, but you in... also hear it like i hear it in the the diner you know like the little mm, corner okay. restaurant when you hear the other tables loudly expressing their opinion when you come in and you know they're expressing mm. it for your benefit um is the nice way i can put that but these these are things i've heard my whole life wait wait and, i want to something i i, yeah. I want to touch on that again and i promise the listener will get back to the current situation yeah, yeah. but you're saying they saying it for your benefit like they actually when you come in and you're a black person or a black family and there's a white family having dinner or a group of white people they will say that loudly directed at you or not directed, not directed at you but like at me. It's directed at the, the others air, but but, it's, yeah, but it's, they it's, will know you'll hear having... it and they'll yeah yeah, yeah, it's it's we have this thing called Minnesota nice here um, where you will always be polite and be nice to someone's face. But you may you may say some, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of sideways or rude things. I don't I don't know how else to put it. I always think of like uh, like everybody loves Raymond, the mom on that show. I don't know if you've ever seen that sitcom, but she was always make, taking digs at his wife. Mm -hmm. That is that is Minnesota nice in a nutshell. Like you're going to mm -hmm. say something nice, but it's like. Wow, you really tried hard to bake this pie. If you would only let me teach you how to bake pie, you could really make it better. You know, stuff like that. Like, mm. it's just, that's how we are, you know. Mm. Um, say very nice things to someone in their face, and then the moment Minnesotans turn around, they'll talk about that person. And, you know, could you believe their hair was like that or what, whatever. Mm. But so, it, yeah, it's not uncommon for me to hear a loud conversation, um, you know, that I clearly think is for my benefit, where people will be talking about what's wrong with this country or, or what the blacks need to do. Or I have often heard in my life, like, I'm not talking about you, Gunner. You're one of the good ones and you've worked hard and you've done this and see there is, there can't be racism because you're successful and you've been able to do this. And, you know, you just want to scream out like I am one person. I am someone who benefited from having a white mother and being, um, allowed and accepted into some that she fought hard to make sure I was allowed into and that we had good, um, you know, like good housing and, and these things. And she struggled to make sure we had those. And I'm also lucky that I, I am intelligent and I was able to get scholarships and, you know, work my butt off. But did I have to work harder than, you know, uh, if I were, were uh, 100% white? Hell yes, I believe I had to work harder. All right. Um, 
let's get back to what's yeah. happening now. Yeah. Um, with all of that context, when the the riots started, and now we're getting mm -hmm. into the, I guess, the weekend, the very recent last few days, yeah. um, how are things going? What are you doing? What is what do you think is happening is going to happen paint me a picture of the situation now um so to paint a picture of the situation now last night um we were under under a curfew at 8 p.m everybody was to be in indoors inside not not outside in your yard not anywhere get indoors and stay indoors um i am part of a neighborhood watch an organized neighborhood watch put together by our city council person and some local community leaders. We have been instructed to, if we're going to be out there defending our neighborhoods, to be in bright clothing, to make sure we can identify ourselves, to never be alone, to be in at least two people. Um, they want us to make sure that if we are a group out, that there's another group nearby who can identify us by our names, our birth dates, and our addresses. Like you just need to know other people's stuff mm -hmm. um, if we're going to be out defending. Uh, I'm hearing Black Hawk helicopters overhead. I smell burning in the air, and there is smoldering buildings throughout the city. Um, yeah. Yeah. What do you do in the neighborhood watch? Who do you defend against? What is the goal? So the goal is to make sure that we're at a place now where we have outside agitators here. Um, mm. We have people who've come in, whether they be from out state or from other states or just from the suburbs, and uh, they want to come and um, they want to they want to cause mayhem. And so they're they're coming in, and um, we we've had some fires over here in North Minneapolis. And one of them was, was a, a black barbershop and the black barbershop is, um, that is a, that is a sacred place. That is a, it is a refuge and it is the kind of place and it's a, an experience that only a, a, a black man would understand. But, you know, you go to the barbershop and that is where community gathering happens. Um, and so it's a place of importance and the, the, um, the police chief or, the, or not police chief, the fire, um, chief or whoever it was that that fire department that was putting out the the barbershop fire when they were getting ready to leave they made a point of coming over to the onlookers and saying we know that you didn't do this we know north no north sider would burn down the shop um so you know we have these things happening and there's targeted fires so that caused the community leaders the organizers of different um, groups here and our city council person to say we need to protect ourselves the first night of real big riots there was almost no police presence on the streets this is before the national guard really got called up um the governor had said well i'm calling up the national guard but he vastly underestimated the first night that he put the curfew in place the number of people that were going to take to the streets and so the police just like they just retreated they didn't know what to do they were overwhelmed um there were thousands on the streets throughout the entire city while we had maybe like 1,000 total officers to deal with everything so the fire department was not responding to fire calls for like 90 minutes to two hours because they needed to know that that area was secure and safe before they would even attempt to go put out a fire mm -hmm. so that left us in the situation where we needed to defend our own properties, our own communities. And so you had um, people out there standing on corners and just kind of keeping away the the um, looters or rioters or whatever. You know, you have business owners who are standing out there just saying, you know, this is a black owned business. Leave this alone. Um, and so we were, we were there to help. You know, people are out there to help and ensure that those outside agitators, because that's where we're at now, it's outside agitators, are not able But to th start these... fires or break property. You're saying this is black owned, a black-owned business. So first of all, the description of having to do do this is surreal for me. Like you're actually standing on the street watching for people who might show up to break your, your stuff. Um, yeah. I, we've had riots in France and in Paris, a, you know, a few times over the, the course of my life. I don't think that was you know, how it went for the people stayed indoors, but, and they say, this is black owned. Do you mean that the outside agitators are black? And if you tell them this is black owned, they will go away 
or that's the hope. Um, mm. So when you look at the like all the buildings are boarded up now and a lot of the corridors where the protests have been and you'll see painted on the outside of the building. I took a lot of pictures of it yesterday where it'll say like, please don't burn children live above here or black owned business or community mm. owned business. Um, and they're putting these messages on the outside or signage in the window just to say, you know, please, please leave this one alone. It doesn't save everyone, every building, but it's helped save some. I mean, it was very clear when I was down documenting yesterday and taking pictures that you'd see destruction, destruction, destruction. Then you'd see something, you know, untouched or unharmed. And it would say like child care center, black owned, um, children live mm -hmm. above here, all these kind of messages. And the, the, the rioters did not burn or destroy those those places of business. Because what where my mind went when you said outside uh, uh, agitators is the idea that it would be people who are there to take advantage of the chaos to loot um, or just to, you know, I don't know. We have, have some fun. of that. Yeah. Um, but they, they are, I don't know, s s sensitive to the idea that if it's a black owned business, they won't like, it's not right. It's not. Well, they're not the ones that would be sensitive to that. The actual, you have these these different groups and that's where this gets crazy is that you have like mm. the 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 rioters and you have people who are upset and want social justice so they are burning things like the corporate businesses and the banks um and and saying until you change the system we will burn down your system and we will rebuild together um and that is a a I don't condone that um type of protest I understand it though um it's not my style and it will never be. And I will speak out against it forever. I think that there's another way, but I understand that pain, but there is also a group, you know, yesterday we had two men arrested who are from these, I think it's called the bugaboo boys or something, but they are a, they're a, a white, white supremacist group. They're, they're a crazy group that wants to foment um, this stuff to cause a race war. Um, And so they were they were caught on video yesterday. They came down in their, you know, their full G.I. Joe outfits. They had the AR-15s on. These are just two citizens. These aren't police. And they're there and they're trying to say to the people, we're here to protect you. And um, we're going to make sure you have the right to exercise your rights. But then they've got the, the you know, white supremacist tattoos and things, some of these markers. And so people very rightfully let the the police and the National Guard know. And they, they were able to to detain them whether they were actually arrested or just removed from the situation i don't know but we have some of those actors here too so what the concern is over in the north side and in, in our neighborhood is that we are going to have some of these racially motivated bad actors coming in trying to burn down our neighborhood trying to stoke up the anger and to start a race war that is the concern mm. we also live in a food desert And so we, you know, when we lose a, like the Walgreens got, got broken into and vandalized and burned here, that is the only pharmacy within like two or three miles or whatever for the people that live around there. These are low income people. They depend on that. So when we lose that, we lose major infrastructure within this community. We have one grocery store left that people are defending, you know, all throughout the night. So they're yeah, actually these, there. These the Do people. they have weapons? I uh, can't answer that. <laughs> I mean, I, I have I seen weapons. Uh, I've seen weapons out in, you know, but are they supposed to have weapons? No. You know, America's a weird place, right? Like you can openly carry a long gun. You can have a permit. Um, I used to have my permit for, for we call it CCW, conceal and carry weapons. Um, so you can carry a, a, a handgun on you. Um, so, you know, there, there are people who it's not hard to get that here mm. to have a, 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 a handgun permit and then, you know, long guns are always fair game. So, yeah, I mean, there are, there are people mm. who are armed. They're ready to, ready to do what they have to do to defend that, that space. I don't want to get back into the, you know, second amendment, but <laughs> as someone who lives in a relatively peaceful part of the world it is strange to me it um is. Yeah. so what do you want oh boy what do i want <laughs> um, i guess what what do you want to see happen how do you think this is going to evolve and what would be 
what do you think would be a road to a resolution if possible i mean uh, i the the best outcome would be to fix racism right like yeah yeah let's... that's heavy lifting we got so <laughs> I, let, let's do this i want to tell you some mm. of the positives we we can't be all negative and getting into the bad here because we are seeing some beautiful things coming about right now so what i would want you know in a word is like you said let's let's end racism let's fix it that's huge um but let's elect obama the... again that that fixed it the first time right that's right, what i understood right, yeah. so um, all right I, I would I would lead to say that yeah we yes we're I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> sorry um, I'm I'm sorry just go to, ahead yeah, yeah I just want to um so like here's some of the beautiful things we're seeing right now like the call went out um two days ago to say we lost our you know this is a food desert here in North Minneapolis we lost our um our pharmacy we we've lost these infrastructures for people to be able to to get groceries and to do things and there's there's a need we need donations right people asked for donations and they said one of the schools around here said you know these kids that normally get um assistance food assistance for their families during this time especially with covid the schools have been providing families with food that's where a lot of that distribution is happening well it can't happen right now because of these the the craziness in this city. So they put a call out and said, we're collecting donations. And if we could get 85 bags of food for some kids in need, they got over 2000. Um, they were, they were inundated. And, uh, you know, you got people coming from outstate and from the suburbs who they're bringing food, um, and supplies. And, you know, so you're seeing yesterday, there were hundreds lined up to get this stuff. And it's mostly white people bringing these donations. Um, yesterday when I was out documenting the cleanup, it was mostly um, white people in Black Lives Matter shirts and in their church, you know, shirts or whatever um, doing that cleanup. We're seeing this coming together that you don't normally see. And we're seeing people paying attention to North Minneapolis and providing the assistance that North Minneapolis needs that we don't normally see. And they're not, you know, complaining about why can't these people get a job and do this on their own and why do I have to come here? They're just they're just coming and they're helping. Do, um, and do you this think is some of the pandemic? Them, do you think some of them might have been people who would have said something like that before? In other words, yeah, are those yes, people? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There was literally a guy yesterday who was on our our local news here because he had a uh, he was in, he was handing out water to protesters and asking people if they were okay. His truck had like MAGA on it, and he drives around with a big American flag in it. You know, like he is a Trump, you know, a Trump supporter from. Uh, rural central Minnesota who drove an hour and a half down to Minneapolis to support people because he saw it was wrong and wanted to help. So, you know, you're seeing, you're seeing some good things. Um, yesterday I went over to 38th in Chicago to document and take pictures. Um, and crazy enough, like just to tell you the magnitude of violence against black people by police in this, in this country, I've gone to, you know, a rally every day. Now, the first day I went to a rally and the speakers, two of the speakers, one of them was Eric Garner's mother. One of them was Philando Castile's mother. Um, both of them lost their sons to police violence. Um, yesterday when I went over to 38th in Chicago, which is where, um, George Floyd was killed, uh, Michael Brown Sr., who is the father of Michael Brown, the the um, young black man that was killed in Ferguson, that set off Ferguson five years ago. He was there. I got to talk to him. But everywhere I go to document what is happening in my city, I'm running into parents who have lost their children to police violence. I mean, that's just that shouldn't happen, right? Like that's a fraternity or a sorority that should not exist. Um, and certainly not at the levels and the ease that it is to run into these people right now. But that is to say, like, there was a church service going on on that corner yesterday. There were thousands of people meeting. Um, there, there are people, you know, trying to console each other as best they can during this pandemic. There's people handing out free, um, masks to people. They don't see a mask and saying, do you have a mask? You know, we still got COVID going on and what can we do? And, and so you got health services and all these things happening in the midst of all this pain and grief and trauma, people are coming together in really neat ways. Um, 
So we are seeing some good come out of this, and hopefully it will lead to the systemic change that we need. One of the things that, you know, everybody says, what can I do? What can I do? And, you know, like I've said, I go to the Humphrey School. Um, only have one credit left. I do have to finish that, but I did officially graduate. <laughs> but at any rate, you know, we're one of the top 10 public policy schools in the nation. And so all of my classmates and my friends from there, you know, what can we do? What can we do? And I just said, you know, well, we, we, can, be, we can be out here trying to help change policy. We can write these policy papers and we can do the research that these social um, justice organizations need because these small social justice organizations we have here, they can't afford to get a think tank to do their research and write them these policy papers that they need to then go present to, you know, present to legislatures. And quite frankly, that's not the role of the grassroots movement. They should be out there doing what they're doing and protesting and not, not rioting and not looting, but protesting and putting pressure on from the outside. But somebody needs to be creating the tools for them to put the pressure on on the inside. So we have committed and, um, you know, thank God for a bunch of my students that are just or, or fellow students, I should say, that are willing to, you know, come together as a group and have already as soon as I said, well, let's do this. Let's figure out how to do this. I, I got inundated by email saying I want to help. I am I am, a, you know, I'm a master of human rights um, candidate right now who's going to graduate next year, but I can do research. I have time for this. I have time for that. And so I'm putting together this network of um, public policy students, who, and we're going we're gonna to do that work for them. And we're going to let them tell us what policies they want researched and what papers they want written, and we'll get those tools together for them so they can concentrate on doing the grassroots groundwork that they need to do, and we'll take care of this other stuff. Um, and so, the and whole, you know, so we're seeing that. We're seeing a rising up of those kind of things. <laughs> the hope is that down the line it will influence policy making, maybe at a local level, um, maybe at a wider level. Uh, to, Local, state, and national, yeah. Yeah, to, to concretely change things. Can you give us one example of a concrete? Because again, you know, when I think about these things, I'm like, yeah, we should end racism. That's Let's do that, <laughs> right? But can you give us an example of one concrete thing you think would take, would be a step in the right direction that would have actual ramifications for the daily lives of, of your community? Um, maybe something yeah, local. So the, I don't know anything. Well, yeah, I can speak specifically. There's um, there's a, a group that's called Reclaim the Block, which is one of our social justice organizations. And um, there are a couple others that are very focused around um, – Re reorganizing and redefining policing in Minneapolis and in this country, but in Minneapolis specifically. And so, you know, in a lot of Americans, America's largest cities, about 40% of the city budget goes to policing. That's wow. a huge amount of money. Yeah. Think 40%? about that. So you're, you're talking, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars. And what this group and what some of these groups are talking about is, you know, there are the extreme ones that say abolish the police. And what they really mean by that is, is just take down the system that we have now and redo it. What we're working on is, okay, you know, if, if we are going to look at that extreme idea and you want to know more about that, we can research that, but let's see what could really happen. And so you're talking about, you have this huge budget. Do you really need it to go into... Um, militaristic vehicles and more weapons, or should we be doing more on training and mental health of the officers and, um, you know, employing more social workers and employing more people for, uh, you know, getting people more de-escalation tactics as opposed to more, yeah. you know, takedown tactics, um, and these kind of things. So that would be a concrete example where these groups want the police to fundamentally change and we will work on and research you know, what that change could look like, where you could actually enact policy and, and do things that would make that change and provide examples where there are police forces, whether they be in America or in other parts of the world, that employ a more, um, you know, social service based police force mm. um, and way of policing and just trying to lay out those paths to help get us there. We're at an interesting inflection point in Minneapolis. The contracts are up right now for our Minneapolis Parks Police. And so it's time to renegotiate with the unions currently. Um, yeah. So th that's all going to happen soon. So there is an opportunity right now to actually make some immediate change and have them do some things. But we need to look, this is this is going to take, like you said, end racism, right? Like that's going to take time. So we need to lay out a plan that's going to take some time, but we also need it not to take too long or you're just going to yeah. keep having this stuff happen. You know, I talked about this with my wife um, who told me, 
she's a lawyer and uh, Finland is a smaller country and there there are many different things between you know the US and Finland I'm not trying to equate this one to one but you were talking mm -hmm. about de-escalation techniques in Finland if an officer uh, uh, fires their weapon uh, outside of training of course it's a huge deal it almost never happens most police officers will never fire their weapon during their lifetime. And and Finland is not unique. You know, Finland is different from the US, but it's not like Finland is the only one, the only country where this happens that way. Um, and the way police officers think about their job, I think is very different uh, from the US. So, so and, and yeah, Second Amendment, gang violence, a lot of things, but... <laughs> You know, there's this, there is this, but, um, talking about police, uh, uh, my understanding is that the, um, police officer, uh, was charged with third degree murder, I believe. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah what, I mean, <laughs> I understand why it's not first degree, it's premeditation first degree, right? But again talking about what it would be looked how it would be looked at in in um finland or i think in any other country at the very least if he didn't in he didn't premeditate i can see that he didn't right maybe he didn't intend to kill him so that would make it not second degree but the irresponsible cause of harm that could reasonably lead to death seems difficult to avoid uh looking at um so it would seem like second degree murder could fit maybe i i'm not uh, i am not a legal expert but maybe the the fbi right. or whoever is charged the the department of justice thinks they can get a convic a conviction on third degree and not on second degree i don't know um but yeah so, so i what think do you... it's important to note that um mike freeman who is our our um uh, the the attorney that was in charge of this it's been taken away from his office and given to attorney general the state attorney general now um who is reassessing those charges but i think for mike freeman he is a very conservative and i don't mean that in political terms i mean that in terms of just doing his job he's conservative yeah. so he brought him in as quickly as he could on whatever charges he knew would be okay to bring him in on right then to hold him um you can always upgrade the charges when you go to actually um, try the case. So I, I think that's why that was done, but I do think it was a mistake because it, it set people off. We also had the autopsy was, um, leaked and I just want to, I'm going to, I'm going to look for this real quick for you because the language in there, this is part of the thing that upset people. Um, because in that autopsy, yeah. So the, the autopsy had had a quote in it in the part that was released that said that um, the uh, that it was the combined effect of Floyd being restrained by the police, his underlying health conditions and any potential intoxicants in his system likely contributed to his death. But they said that there was no evidence that um, there was no evidence to support a diagnosis of traumatic asphyxia or strangulation. So people went, they're already doing it. They're already trying to mm. get these cops off. Um, you know, they're going to say that, that it wasn't because of him kneeling on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. So that really upset people again um, and, and led to some of this. Do, and Do you and think it's possible, part of though? The cause. Do you think it's 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 possible or are you saying that this is fixed or beginning I, to be fixed? I think that, um, again, going back to systems, mm. you know, th there there is a there is a way whenever you need a way to, you know, there's always a way to finesse things. Right. I, you, your wife would probably know this best as a lawyer. I think they're best at it in presenting the evidence <laughs> in the way they need to to support their side of the case, their argument. Um, I do not think I, I believe if that officer had not knelt on George Floyd's neck and restrained him in that way for that length of time, George Floyd would be alive. Now, I can't tell you technically 
you know, that like I, you know, I can't tell you that he was strangled to death or whatever, you know, the, the autopsy report, the preliminary report says. But, you know, we see this all the time here where there's a, a demonization of the victim, especially when they are um, victims of color. And black men especially, where they'll say, well, he had, he had marijuana in his system. So um, – and if you know anything about, about uh, you know, drug use, like marijuana can be in your system for like a week after you've, you've smoked marijuana and whatever. Like I don't think that makes you some crazy killer. Uh, but, you know, they'll start to say, yeah, you know, he, he, he had been drinking a bit and da 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 And they say all these things and then they show you previous mug shots as opposed to showing you a picture of that man in his, you know, wedding day or a graduation mm-hmm. picture of a young man or whatever. They demonize the victim to say, you know, obviously he was acting in a way that justified this officer taking his life. Um, and so that's where that comes from. But, no, I fully believe that if, if um, that officer had not knelt on his neck. For eight minutes and 46 seconds while he pleaded and said over and over and over, I can't breathe. Like, what more do you need? How is that not the result of, you know, one action led to to that result? So, you know, presenting the evidence in the way they did in the preliminary autopsy is just BS to me. But, you know, so what would be my opinion? Yeah, Um, I think it's a reasonable one but um so (laughs) what do you think is going to happen now i mean i maybe some people aren't aware of this i doubt it but we're still like very much in the middle of riots um you were saying that you might need to evacuate depending on how things go you might need to evacuate your house um yeah what do you think is going to happen over the next few days and then the next few months um it it it's always jarring uh, when you were saying there are some beautiful things happening one part of my mind is like yeah this is amazing and another part is okay what's going to happen next time uh there's a decision to be made about these topics are the people now finally thinking we need to do something about it are they going to go back to their previous mindset or uncertainty or well you know it was a special i don't know you know but yeah for the next few few days and then we'll end over the next few months i guess um yeah how do you see the situation evolving so i think for minneapolis specifically i am hopeful that we will um we will see more community policing community, um, taking care of all of our neighborhoods. And it's not just happening in North Minneapolis. It's happening in other neighborhoods too. I was actually, um, you know, up all night, um, till at least four 30 in the morning. Uh, but I was on communicating with friends from some South Minneapolis neighborhoods and we're all communicating and using our different messaging apps. But, you know, there's videos going back and forth of these guys just drove by. They have no license plates on their car. We don't know them. Be on the lookout for this vehicle. Everyone was communicating well. Everybody was doing what they needed to do to protect their part of the city from outside agitators. And like, we're all coming together in a good way and working with law enforcement. It's important to say that. I would hope that in the next few days, the citizens of Minneapolis get what they are protesting for. I would hope the three other officers are um, charged and brought into custody and that all four, which is what we're asking for, we're asking for all four officers to be charged. Our chief of police said yesterday to, yesterday or the day before, to George Floyd's brother, to his family, I believe the inaction of the other officers there makes them complicit in this act. Now, you know, he's the chief of police. He can't um, say certain things, but that's as close as he can get to saying they should all four be charged. Mm. Um, So I would hope that that would happen. I would hope that that would lead to um, we would evolve and still have peaceful protests during the day. I would hope that the protests stay large, but that they are peaceful and they happen, you know, in a in a concentrated area downtown. They happen during the day, but we need them. You know, people are not practicing social distancing at these things right now. Not everybody has a mask on. Like we're still in a pandemic, right? So we need to get to a point where we protest um, socially distantly and we do it responsibly, but we do it in number and in force to make sure the pressure stays on for the government to change. And so immediately. 
my hope is that order is restored and that the burning stops, the looting stops, and that we are able to get back to a bit of normalcy and not be under curfew. You know, curfew goes from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. here um, and has for the last three days now. I've got Black Hawk helicopters flying overhead. Mm. Um, you know, with the fires, there were there was a Black Hawk helicopter with, you know, those fire buckets like you see like in the movies where the helicopter comes down and swoops onto the lake and grabs all the water and then goes and throws it to put out a fire. They were doing that in downtown Minneapolis, like on our inner city lakes. There was a, a Black Hawk helicopter that came and grabbed water from an inner city lake and then flew off to put out fire. Like this is just – it's dystopian. So my immediate hope is that that all stops um, and we don't have any more looting, rioting and just the fear we have right now where it's like people are like there's three you know white kids in a car driving around. Nobody knows them. They don't have license plates on and like – I don't want to spend my nights up and worrying about, mm. you know, some vehicle and, and more importantly, maybe it's just some idiot kids that didn't get home in time. Like, you know, I, I want that to go away. But I do want the protests to continue. I want them to continue responsibly. I want everyone to get masks. I want people to, you know, be able to get the services they need. And I want us all to have the hard conversations in in some safe spaces and allow everybody to state their opinion so we can get to a place of common understanding and and everybody can understand the plight of um, black people in this country. And it, it is one of the other beautiful things I'm seeing is that, you know, I have people reaching out to me and, um, you know, I grew up, as I said, in the suburbs and, and I have a white mom and I grew up in white culture. So a lot of my friends from growing up and everything are white. And uh, I have people reaching out to me to say, I don't know what to say to you, but I see you, I hear you and I want to support you. Um, and that's it. You know, so I just hope where we move on from that and we keep that energy and people people do that that work of trying to understand each other and continue to call for equality for all. Um, the thing that strikes me is that no matter what you believe, um, retweeting something doesn't really achieve much um yeah listening to a show on by itself and feeling uh maybe a little bit the the, the emotional weight of things by itself does nothing um the 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 one thing that actually has an effect or let's say the, 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 the most important thing is to vote. It is very yeah. disheartening to me how few people vote in the U.S. And I know there are difficulties and, and special circumstances, and but there's nothing else. That's what people need to do. So um, if... And it, it applies to everything and everyone. So, uh, yeah, vote. I guess yes, yes. If, if that's just again, I insist because this is something that we all need to learn. Tweeting does nothing. <laughs> Retweeting does nothing. You feel it. You know, we've talked about this on the show before, but you get this feeling like, Oh, I, I retweeted someone. I, I did my part. Um, not really. The part that you can do is to vote. Uh, so that's the way I feel anyway. So, um, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think, um, yeah, voting is important. It's also important that, you know, I have so many white people saying, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't, what do I do? What do I do? And it's like, well, you can educate yourself too, you know, and there are things you can, we can all read a book, right? Like we can all, it, it, we can all try and reach out and talk to somebody, but I think it's important for people to understand and white people, especially like it, it is not, It is not appropriate for you to approach the first person of color you see and ask them to explain all this to you. <laughs> like it's not it's not my job as a person of color to do your work on improving relations or helping you to understand. I will gladly do it if I have the time and the energy. Which but thank you for doing not, it with me, by the way. I, I very right, much right. appreciate it. it. But it but it's not it's not our job, right? So mm -hmm. there are things like I know Baratunde Thurston just put together um a a bookshop like he has an online bookshop which has a bunch of books that can help you with this you know there's a book called white fragility which we used in in school um two years ago now 
that is by Robin D'Angelo, I want to say. Um, and it, it, it is a book that will give you the language and some great concepts and understanding around this idea of just like systemic white supremacy. Because, you know, it, 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 and I hated the book myself, but that's because I'm a person of color and I was like, I know all this. But it was amazing how that helped inform um, some of my white classmates who just had never thought about some of these things in that way and really were all of a sudden able to see and understand just how their white privilege allowed them to live the life they lived and more importantly allowed them not to see the life that I live and that so many with, with you know, who are, who are black and brown live. Um, yeah. you, so, you know, so there's things like that we can all do. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, but yeah. I, I, I really don't want to turn the show even at the end into, you know, how to <laughs> overcome your privilege. Um, right. But I do want to mention it is on the scale of the unpleasantness that we have, and we all have unpleasantness, privileged or not, especially not mm -hmm. privileged, but privileged as well, it is unpleasant to understand the privilege you have. It is an attack on your identity. I completely understand this, you know? Yes. Being told, as a white, straight man, I have had... a. Uh, uh, benefits and strengths and, and privilege that others have not been afforded is essentially telling me you've had it easy. Essentially what you've achieved isn't really worth as much as maybe some what some other people have achieved because it was easier for you. It is not pleasant to hear and it requires you to accept that you're being attacked in a way. And, you know, I say this fully aware that I'm saying it in the context of everything we've talked about before, but... I want to acknowledge this because I think it's important for people to who feel attacked and whose reaction might be, well, then, F you. You know, you, you feel like, oh, I'm being told this, bah, F you. I think it's important to understand this is normal. And, and that feeling you get of becoming antagonistic is a natural way of dealing with that feeling. But the feeling is normal. And I, I would just agree with like, you a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's important. I, I just want to say, I agree. And I, I, I agree with you. It's valid. And, you know, saying that, um, your positionality as a, as a straight white male has allowed you privilege does not, um, denigrate or take away from the fact that you worked your ass off to get where you are and you built your business and you did everything you needed to do. It is just to say that it would, there are forces in place that don't afford me the same opportunity to do what you did. That does mm -hmm. not say that what you did was not well earned, hard fought for and 100% of your effort and energy. And I want to make sure everybody hears that because there are people across this country in America and across the world who are white, black, blue, brown. I don't care what you are, but you, you come from a place of poverty and you can't find a way out. And, and that is not, that is not fair. There are systems in place for everyone there, but mm. it is easier for white people in this country to get out of said poverty than it is for people of color. And that is just mm. demonstrably provable through every measure and every statistic. I mean, we can go there and, yeah. and it's, we just need to acknowledge that. I think that the, the, this is, uh, something that people hear all the time. So I think people will be familiar with it. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's just that feeling that when you're told this, you feel attacked and that's because that's how it's supposed to be. It's not like an actual attack against you. It's realizing that, oh, I've had it a little bit easier. So I react, I, I lash out a little bit but you shouldn't lash out. This is what this is. It's not your fault that you're privileged, right. Right. but you're still privileged. And recognizing yes. that means that you can take the steps to help fix that systemic issue that we're factually seeing. It's not, you know, we can't dispute it. We're factually seeing it. And if you want to help fix it, if you look at 
the death of George Floyd and you want to as a white I'm talking about a white as a white person and mm -hmm. I, I feel guilty for you know taking so much time of of this show but as a white person if you see this and you want to do something the first step is to recognize that you have it better and not lash out even though that's your initial uh you have to go past that initial f you and try to understand why and and educate yourself and maybe you know accept that situation and then work together to to fix it well i don't know i'm 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 rambling now <laughs> so one one thing i would say and and something that we've had conversations about in in um humphrey and in, in my school is that i firmly believe that you know a rising tide lifts all boats i don't think that as um white people choose to uh acknowledge their privilege and to d Uh, to dismantle the systems that uh, that have allowed that privilege to exist for, as I said, 400 years. I don't think that this isn't a pie. You know, prosperity isn't a pie. I think that it's just there's prosperity for all. And I do believe, I firmly believe in the American ideal and the American dream. And I think that if we can all come together, there will be a prosperity engine that will happen in this country that has never been seen. And that is saying a lot considering the prosperity and the the economics of America, but I don't think that sharing the privilege or, you know, equalizing the playing field is going to take away from anyone. I believe it is going to benefit everyone, everyone. Um, and, and it will allow wealth to be generated for all and more wealth. And, and you're a hundred percent right. It, it, it is, it is fair to feel angry and to have some of these, you know, it's, we, we call it courageous conversations, right? Like you're holding the tension. It's hard to, to talk about and realize and recognize some of these things. But once we do, and we can get past that and get to the work that needs to be done, it is going to benefit everyone. And we are going to be better. We just, we are. All right. I, I know many people hear all of this and think, yeah, I know. Uh, I, I'm, hoping that it helps a few people listening who might not have realized this, but I don't want to end the show on, you know, talking about white people. <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually didn't want to talk about that at all, but whatever. Uh, That's part of you, right? I, I'll, I'll ask you, um, I don't know, I'll just leave the last words uh, to you before we conclude the show. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Whatever you, you want to say as, a, as the conclusion. I mean, I think we've said, oh, I thank you for the opportunity to talk about no, this. And no, 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 don't do that. Don't, don't thank. No, I, I <laughs> want to. I want to. Um, really, it, it, it's, it's important that we have these conversations. It's important that, um, you know, it means something. I, I want to say one of the, uh, the, having a conversation the other day and there was an older black woman who was saying, you know, this is different this time. Um, we've never seen so many white people join in the cause. We've never seen so many white people honestly talk about Um, like you were just talking about, we've never seen chiefs of police take a knee with the protesters. We've never seen sheriffs walk with the protesters. Um, you know, it's different and that work needs to be done and that work is seen. And so I don't want to make it sound like th that there isn't work there being done by everyone and it, it's being recognized and it's important that we do that, but we've got a lot, a lot more work to do and it isn't going to be easy. And, um, uh, You know, we're going to get there. I, I have hope. And, and I believe that my city um, and my state that I've lived in my whole life and that I love will be a better place um, through all of this. And that out of the fire, we will rise like a phoenix. And, uh, you know, we'll get back to, to that funky city, for, you know, home of, home of Prince. And uh, we'll keep doing what we do. All right. Well, thank you very much, Gunnar, for um, being on the show. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I wish I could do more. We could do more. I guess we can, um, vote, just vote, just go out and vote. Yes. That's yeah. Um, all right. What if people want to, to, uh, hear more from you? I, I understand you have a Twitter account. <laughs> I do. It's uh cigar adventures. So at cigar adventures. It also will on be Instagram at that. 
it will be in the show notes. Anything else you want to point to? Yeah. Um, no, please. Uh, my uh, That same handle is my at Gmail if you want to reach out to me. And if you go to that same handle on Instagram, you can see pictures from around the city um, if you want to see what's happening here on the ground. And that's what uh, I was going to ask you. Um, I'll also, can you please send me um, links to the ma material you talked about earlier in the show? I'll include it in the show notes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And for me, it's not Patrick, uh, one word on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can support the show at patreon.com slash the Phileas Club if you get something out of it and if you wish to support it. Uh, although at the moment, there might be other things better, <laughs> more worth of supporting. Um, and you can find the notes for the show at frenchspin.com. Uh, if you have anything to say, uh, please feel free to do so at the blog. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll be back in a few weeks. Bye. la baignoire. Bonjour la douche. Moi j'appuie sur une touche et je prends rendez-vous aussitôt pour qu'un artisan s'occupe de mes travaux. C'est easy. Prendre rendez-vous en ligne avec un artisan qualifié pour des travaux réussis, c'est simple, c'est easy. Easy by EDF. Informations et conditions sur easy, easy by EDF.fr. Les travaux réussis, c'est simple, c'est easy.